So my name is Charles Hernick. I'm with Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions. Thanks to you all for, for sticking around. Um, we've got a great next panel here that, that focuses on technology and policy for reducing emissions from fossil fuels. And in, in my mind, well, when you, get to, when you organize an event, you get to pick the panel that you get to moderate. And so I picked this one for some very specific reasons. And, and because I think it's timely uh, and I hope optimistic, and, and I think that that's what my intention is that you'll leave, uh, leave the room with that. Before I get things started, though, I do, I want to do like a micro poll. I'm thinking about canceling my papers, my physical newspaper subscription. Does anybody still get the actual physical newspaper? One, like, we're not, we're not the majority. We're the distinct minority. There are a few people. Matt holds up his e-reader tablet. Because I, I asked this for a very specific reason, because you know we all get our news feeds that are tailored to us. Uh, I get a disproportionate amount of information about clean energy, about sailing, and then how to operate a four-month-old child. And it, it's always interesting for me to, to actually open up the newspaper and see what's on the front and see what's in the back, especially considering what some of the world events have been. Global oil prices and, and natural gas prices are, are actually pretty remarkably stable by historical standards. And that's wild, considering what's happening in the Middle East recently, ongoing conflict in Yemen, um, tankers that, that are exploding or, or have exploded recently, and there's a lot of finger pointing, there's a lot of action. And you have to get to the B section of the Wall Street Journal and to page 13 until there's any coverage on the price of oil and what's happening. And it's a pretty sleepy section that focuses on some OPEC meetings uh, and then generally what's happening with consumer demand. And I bring this up because it's, an, it's a major part of the American clean energy story in terms of what's happening in the oil and gas sector, what's happening in fossil fuels. Today, there's a real, final rulemaking announced um, that affects a lot of coal-fired power plants. And my hope is that we're going to be able to cover some of that territory. And we've really covered a lot of territory so far. Uh, in this conversation today, starting from, you know, a lot of comments about Wisconsin and then moving into South Carolina. We've covered a lot of, of the nation, but what I hope is unique about this panel, too, is that we can talk about some of the economic gains that have been happening, some of the development that's been happening here in the United States, but also maintain that global viewpoint on what's happening as it relates to U.S. energy exports uh, writ large and, and not just the electricity sector. And what's happening with, with the panels that I have here with me, Emily O'Connell, who's the Director of Energy Markets Policy with the American Gas Association, Judy Greenwald, who's a principal with Greenwald Consulting and an advisor for the Carbon Capture Coalition, and Jeff Stein, who's a policy advisor for the American Petroleum Institute. These three panelists, who I'll let them introduce themselves in, in just a second here, offer unique perspectives and insights into the clean energy transition that's, that's already been underway in a very uh, substantive way. And I think that that's it. The United States has reduced emissions more than any other country in the world. And we need to understand how that is. It is thanks to renewable, and we've, there's a plenty of excitement for renewables and what's happened over the past decade and where things are going. We talked about that in the last panel. This panel focuses on the fossil fuel sector, some of these legacy assets that have contributed to and driven the success that we've experienced in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. There's a lot more to do, and we wouldn't be having a, a, fully, uh, a full view of, of what's happening in the clean energy space if we weren't taking these perspectives into account. So thank you uh, very much to our panelists, and, and I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, and you can introduce yourself. Judy, since you're closest to me, if you want to go ahead and, and introduce yourself, give a little bit of background and context on, uh, on who, who you work for currently in the Carbon Capture Coalition. Take, take five minutes. partners for bipartisan cooperation, which I am big on. So this is a very interesting day for me. So carbon capture is an essential part of, climate, of the climate solution portfolio, but it's the most neglected. And according to the International Energy Agency, to achieve the Paris Agreement, 
target of um, limiting global warming to two degrees Celsius, about 15% of our carbon emission reductions have to come from carbon capture and storage. And nearly half of those reductions have to come from critical industries like steel, cement, and chemicals that lack other, valuable, other viable emission reduction options. And the recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report on the 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, target, that's the, the more ambitious one that uh, we're supposed to make best efforts towards under the Paris Agreement, there's actually no practical path to meeting that target without carbon capture. And we even need to be removing CO2 from the atmosphere on net in order to achieve negative, in order to achieve negative emission uh, reductions by 2050. So, um, or to, to achieve net negative emissions by 2050. So fortunately, the United States is actually the world leader in large-scale carbon capture, pipeline transport, utilization, and geologic storage. And it began here in the United States in West Texas in the 1970s with the oil industry capturing carbon dioxide from gas processing plants, shipping it by pipeline, and injecting it into oil and gas fields to recover more oil while incidentally storing the carbon dioxide. And then next, they began successfully capturing carbon dioxide from coal gasification, followed by fermentation and ethanol production and refinery hydrogen production, and most recently, electric power generation. And today, the US industry captures roughly 25 million tons of carbon dioxide per year from multiple industries and has injected more than 1 billion tons of carbon dioxide into geologic formations with no major environmental incidents no fatalities, and not even a serious injury. While we are doing a lot of um, enhanced oil recovery using captured carbon dioxide, unfortunately, most of the carbon dioxide that we now use for enhanced oil recovery actually comes from natural sources of carbon dioxide. So we actually drill for naturally occurring carbon dioxide, we bring it up to the surface, and then we inject it back underground for enhanced oil recovery. And meanwhile, industrial sources are spewing billions of tons of CO2 into the atmosphere as a waste when at least some of that could be put to productive use. The good news for the environment is that the oil industry has to inject substantially more carbon dioxide into a field to recover a barrel of oil than comes back out in the form of oil. And the International Energy Agency estimates that a nearly 37% total reduction in life cycle emissions compared to other oil production methods. And industry in the United States is starting to store carbon dioxide in saline formations as well, which involves no additional oil production. And going forward, the United States can store well over a century's worth of our nation's emissions in oil and gas fields and thousands of years' worth in saline formations. So the bottom line is that carbon capture works, it can be scaled to be a major climate solution, and US industry is poised to maintain its global leadership position if we continue to lead on the federal policy front as well. Fortunately, carbon capture also can break, help break the logjam on climate policy by bringing all sides together, if sometimes for different reasons. Uh, in 2010, after the comprehensive Waxman-Markey climate legislation died in the Senate, Brad Crabtree of the Great Plains Institute and I, at the time I was at the Pew Center on Global Climate Change, asked the question, what can we do that would make genuine progress on climate change and that could garner support across the political spectrum? So we started something called the National Enhanced Oil Recovery Initiative, it was also known as NIORI, to advocate for strengthening the for Section 45Q tax credit, that's the Section 45Q of the US tax code, for capturing carbon dioxide from man-made sources. Our members did not all agree on why they wanted this tax credit. For some, it was about using carbon dioxide and enhanced oil recovery to increase domestic oil production. For others, it was providing a future for coal in a carbon-constrained world. And for others, it was about job creation. And for others, it was about climate protection. And we started with just a few environmentalists, labor unions, businesses, and state officials. I left to work for Secretary Moniz at DOE. But under Brad's leadership, Niori continued to expand over time to include 60 member organizations, and it changed its name to the Carbon Capture Coalition to reflect the broader set of opportunities to use captured carbon dioxide to make fuels, materials, and products, or simply to store it underground just to keep CO2 out of the atmosphere. 
Just last year, the coalition had a major success, the enactment of the 45Q credit tax reform, uh, 45Q tax credit reform, expansion and extension, and it happened because of strong support of senators and congressmen across the political spectrum. This was a tremendous victory, but our work is not yet done. As with renewables, we need a suite of policies to drive carbon capture innovation. The coalition just released its policy blueprint. It looks like this. We don't have them with us today, but you can get them up online at um, carboncapturecoalition.org. And um, it inc includes ensuring the effective implementation of the tax credit by the Internal Revenue Service, as well as complementary policies to incentivize carbon capture projects and supporting infrastructure like carbon dioxide pipelines. For example, the Carbon Capture Coalition has proposed model guidance to the Internal Revenue Service for the definition of what it means to have secure geologic storage. This is a remarkable coalition making remarkable progress, a real bright spot in the climate and energy policy landscape. Thanks, Judy. I, I appreciate your introductory remarks, and I think that there are a couple of like really key takeaways. Uh, is that if you're if you come into this room and you're concerned about climate change, we can't solve the climate problem without a deep and serious look at carbon capture storage, and not even a look, but the implement active implementation. And what I love about it is that it's an American innovation story, uh, and so I hope that we can keep it that way. And and uh, as a as a take home for for folks in the room, uh, Jeff, you're next in line. Do you want to 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 take over? Sure. Thanks, Charles. Sure. Well, thank you, Charles, for pulling together this panel. And of course, thank you to Chris for pulling together a, a great event for including us. Um, I'm Jeff Stein. I work at API in our relatively new market development department. I work as a policy advisor. Market development, as I said, is it's a little bit new. And the focus is promoting the use of domestically produced natural gas, both in the US and increasingly abroad. And so I think given the topic of this panel, I think it, it would be logical to start off my remarks with a bit of a success story. And the success story involves CO2 emissions from the power sector. The power sector historically had been the largest contributor of greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide. And that's no longer the case. And that's been driven by uh, increasing deployment of clean burning natural gas technology in the United States. Since 2005, there's been about a 28% reduction in CO2 emissions from the power sector. And according to the Energy Information Administration, or EIA, over half of that comes from the switch from older fossil units to newer, efficient, natural gas power generating units in the United States. That is the largest contributor to the decreased emissions in the power sector. And EIA lists about, I think, 329 million metric tons of CO2 abatement from the switch to clean burning natural gas generation. Just for some context, 329 million metric tons of CO2 abatement, that's the same as offsets representing, I looked it up, it's about 380 million acres of forestry. That's 20 South Carolinas. It's uh, quite remarkable. And even further beyond the existing technology of natural gas generation that's allowed and provided for this significant reduction in CO2, this deep reduction in CO2 emissions, the technology continues to improve. I know my co-panelists talked a lot about CCS. In addition to developments in CCS, there's been significant improvements in gas power plant efficiency. Uh, one of the key measures of that being the heat rate of the engine that is plummeted, right? The, the lower the heat rate, the, 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 the fewer molecules you need to generate one unit of electricity has plummeted since 2005 and is continuing uh, to drop. Additionally, natural gas generation has allowed for lower emissions of CO2 because the unique physical attributes of the generating facilities, they're able to relatively quickly ramp up and ramp down to match the changing output from renewable energy, both throughout uh, different weather patterns, times of day, seasons. There was a study a couple years ago from the National Bureau of Economic Research that found globally, right, globally in the long term, a 1% increase in natural gas's share of a country's generation enables 0.88% growth in renewable energy share of that generation. And I think that that link is not surprising, but it's very strong. And 
this is a global issue. Reducing emissions is a global issue, and America has an opportunity to be a global leader in, clean, in the clean energy economy. When we think about this from the natural gas side, we have an abundant resource. The U.S. has become the third largest exporter of LNG. We were importing this a few years ago. It's phenomenal, the revolution that's taken place from natural gas exports. And when we think about it, not only from the trade benefits, the geopolitical impacts, the econ local economic development impacts, but from a, a global clean air perspective, when you think about how uh, power demand and energy demand, where it's taking off is in these non-OECD markets, it's taking place in uh, urbanization, it's taking place in the exponential growth and projected growth of air conditioning. With this significant growth in electricity demand globally, I think by 2040, the air conditioning demand of the emerging economies will require the capacity of the US, the EU, and Japan combined today. And so addressing these issues, addressing economic development, energy poverty issues in a way that also keeps emissions low and sustainable will require cleaner deployment of, of fossil generation, renewables, efficiency, all these different technologies that we've heard from today and, and on the panel. And so I would close by saying we often talk about, and we've talked about this from a long time, that energy policy should be all of the above. And I would offer just a little tweak to that because I don't think we quite know what all of the above looks like today. We certainly didn't five or 10 years ago when we were saying it as well. And so the, the, the tweak I would suggest or a way I, I like to think about it is energy policy is any of the above. And folks who are impacted by what kind of energy is deployed, what kind of resources they want, ought to have the opportunity to define what they want. Cleaner energy, uh, reduced emissions, reliable, resilient, and affordable. And then from there, different technologies, different fuels, different companies can compete for that business. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Great, great introductory remarks, and I'm glad that you tied it to that global market that I that I started out with. Uh, it's it's a real uh, not battle out there, but there's there's a real tension internationally to to get those first kilowatt hours of power uh, to turn the lights on in the first place in big parts of of Africa still, or to have some chance over over where you're getting your power from in in Eastern Europe. It was just last year that I was in Budapest, Hungary. Uh, at their invitation to to speak at a conference where they love the idea, and even if they'll never buy American liquefied natural gas, the option and the power that they have to push back against the Russians at the negotiating table gives them all of the flexibility and freedom in the world uh, that they've been desperately needing and, and wanting for for a long time. So thank you, Jeff, for for your remarks and, and sharing that. Um, Emily, nap, not la last but not least, uh, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. That's okay. Hi, I'm Emily O'Connell. I'm with the American Gas Association. Thank you to Chris. Uh, thank you to Charles for having us here. Um, we really appreciate being invited. Um, we love to tell our story, and we love to talk about how we are reducing emissions. Um, in case you're not familiar with it, the American Gas Association is the national association we represent investor-owned natural gas utilities. Um, we have members across the country. We are serving our customers every day with the energy that we use um, to heat our homes, to heat our water, to cook our food, to run our gas dryers. So you are reliant and dependent upon natural gas every day. Um, we have a long track record of reducing our emissions as well. Um, we like to remind people that from 1970, we have reduced gas customers' carbon emissions footprint um, by half. We've cut it in half in these almost 50 years. Um, that's just at uh, the residential home, but when you look across our entire um, pipeline distribution system, we have gotten emissions down 72%. So they are now 0.1% of emissions um, when you compare that to all the natural gas that's produced. So that's, that's pretty incredible. Um, and I will say that our members continue to work on this. We continue to invest in upgrading our pipelines and our infrastructure, not only for safety um, and reliability reasons, but also to reduce these emissions. Um, so yes, we, we like to think that we have a great track record, but we are fully aware that more needs to be done. Um, we know that in order for natural gas utilities to remain competitive, um, to continue to provide a value proposition well into the future that we need to um, further reduce our emissions. 
and look towards lower carbon fuel sources. Um, we're embracing this opportunity. It is certainly a challenge, but we have um, three pillars that we have set out, um, and we think that all three of these need to be advanced in order to get us to a state of um, deep emissions reductions and one in which natural gas utilities still play a significant role in delivering that energy that we use every day. Um, I'll talk a little bit about these three pillars and the technologies there. Um, the first pillar is, as Jeff mentioned, working to advance energy efficiency. That should always be the priority. And luckily, there are a lot of great organizations out there working on energy efficiency policies and such and technologies. Um, this is going to require deep retrofits in our existing building stock. Um, it's not an area that's new for natural gas utilities. We invest a lot of time, energy, and resources in building out our utility-operated energy efficiency programs. Um, if you're not familiar with these, I encourage you to look to your natural gas utility and find out what type of program they offer. Um, every day, natural gas utilities across the country, we are collectively investing $4 million on a daily basis in our energy efficiency programs. We take this very seriously. Um, and as a result of that, gas consumption in about the last 50 years has stayed relatively flat. We have a great chart that we like to use that shows the rise in customer base. We've added about 30 million customers in that same time frame. And you look at the gas consumption sales volume, and it's basically flat. Uh, the second pillar I want to mention is um, we have to develop new advanced natural gas technologies. So what do I mean by natural gas technologies? I'm not talking about the upstream side of things, but I'm talking about the appliances that we are using in our homes and businesses on this daily basis. So what we use for space and for water heating, for cooking, for drying. Um, it's, it's going to require the implementation of these new advanced technologies into our homes and businesses that are really going to allow us to cut our customers' carbon footprint. Um, we've invested time in this already. Last year, we did a report that, that looked at um, a wide variety of technologies. We looked at about 100, um, and, and the market research firm identified about 30 priority technologies that are close to commercialization that, if implemented, could reduce a customer's footprint in their home up to about 40%, which is quite significant. Um, the third pillar, which I am particularly excited about, not only are we looking to improve the efficiency of our customers, but our utilities are actually looking to reduce the carbon intensity of the fuel that they are putting through their pipe so that when it gets to the customer, it is already a lower carbon intensity. Um, so how do we do this? They are looking at various forms of renewable natural gas and hydrogen blending. Um, renewable natural gas, if you're not familiar with it already, it is a carbon neutral fuel. Um, our members are very excited about this. There are already several programs implemented across the country and more utilities that are looking at opportunities to both bring RNG onto their pipeline and blend it into their system and deliver it to their customers. There are three primary forms of production right now, anaerobic digestion, which relies on organic waste streams, um, so wastewater treatment facilities, uh, manure from farms, um, and landfills are the three primary feedstock areas. There's methane that's naturally produced from these waste stocks. Um, it is captured, it is cleaned up, it is processed, and it is put back into the pipeline. And it allows utilities to deliver both a lower carbon fuel and a renewable source of fuel, which is something that gas utilities have not really been able to claim. It's something that our brethren in the electric utility industry have been doing for a long time now. But it's a new area for gas utilities, and, and we're excited about it. Uh, the second technology is gasification. This also requires organic material, a lower moisture material. Um, it's exposed to high pressure. The gases are extracted, again, processed and cleaned up and can be injected into the pipeline. And then the third area, which is really the most innovative um, and arguably the most exciting, is power to gas technology. Uh, this relies on excess renewable electricity, so think solar, wind, energy. Um, you take that excess electricity, you run it to power a water electrolyzer, you capture the hydrogen. You can either use that hydrogen, store it, you can blend it into the gas pipeline, or you can use a carbon capture method and blend it with the carbon to create renewable methane, which is 
um, RNG. Methane is just uh, CH4, so carbon and hydrogen. Um, the other really important thing to note about power to gas is that it offers an energy storage solution. Um, it's different than batteries. A lot of our members are encouraged and looking at this um, because not only does it offer a storage solution, but it can help balance their grid and it offers um, more flexibility for them as well. Uh, I think we'll get into this a little bit, but I'll just close by saying that we, um, we're we really excited about the things that we're doing, but we certainly know that we are up against a lot of uh, obstacles um, and pushback out there. I, we are doing a good job, I think, telling our message. We can always be doing more, um, but we are confronted with a lot of policies and proposals out there at the state mm -hmm. level, at the municipal level, that quite frankly don't even want to give us the chance to, um, to implement these new measures. Um, we're seeing things that are proposals that are seeking to incentivize fuel switching away from natural gas, prohibiting the development and the expansion of natural gas infrastructure, um, seeking all out fossil fuel bans. So this, we find this obviously quite concerning um, <laughs> and a bit short sighted. And I'll just close, I, you know, we, um, the society likes to talk about all the advancements in technology that we'll expect on the electric side and on the energy storage side and with batteries. And we sort of take the gas side for granted. And we don't expect that we'll see that same kind of ingenuity and in technology advancement and emissions reductions on the gas side. And I think that's really unfortunate because it's just quite frankly not true. Um, so happy to answer more questions that you have and look forward to this discussion. Uh, we talked a lot today about the successes of reducing emissions from the electricity sector. That's a, a big thing. Um, but looking at the built environment in terms of homes and businesses, there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, I have a, a confession that I should probably make as a, a clean energy advocate. Um, fuel oil is still a pretty big problem in big parts of the Northeast and, and the Mid-Atlantic. I have it looks like it's a 100-year-old tank that's outside of my house that gets filled up. And the only thing worse that it could be filled up with is, like, baby seal oil or something like that. But, like, this, it's, it's fuel oil. It's dirty. It's not efficient. Uh, I know that I need to upgrade. I've only lived there for two years. I've got an infant, so I've got plenty of excuses. But it just illustrates that even for people that care, uh, there are real constraints that we're facing and that we, need, we do need to look at, at the households on, in terms of what people can do to employ the best possible uh, technologies there. Um, we heard just now from two congressmen that, that I think have it together in terms of, of where they want to see uh, the, the country headed and, and certainly have um, the best information in front of them. I do talk to a lot of elected officials in, in other uh, parts of the, the, you know, the United States and, and even here around Washington, D.C., that, that, you know, they're like, Charles, you know, clean energy, it sounds good, and I know that it pulls well. But I'm, I'm concerned about stranded assets when I talk to business people and, and you know, folks have invested a lot of money and, and uh, several of the industries represented here have invested a lot of money over the past hundred years to get us to this incredible point where we have cheap, reliable electricity. Um, how do those conversations of stranded assets come up either as a, a risk um, or, or Judy as a, a potential opportunity to, to decrease, um, you know, the emissions that, you know, Emily, you mentioned what, uh, reducing emissions that are, that are coming out at the end by focusing on what's going into the pipes. Um, if y'all could talk a little bit more about stranded assets, how you view them and, and how in your particular, uh, industries you're looking at, at changing that from a risk to a potential opportunity, that'd be great. Go ahead, Emily. I'm happy to start. Um, sure. Yeah, think, great question. Um, this is an issue we talk about a lot and that our members talk about a lot. Um, for us, the risk there is um, the policies and proposals that I mentioned that would seek to eliminate fossil fuels or eliminate um, the development of more natural gas infrastructure or incentivize these fuel switching. Um, so what you risk there is the stranded asset of the natural gas pipeline infrastructure that um, is paid for, is in the ground, is the safest form of energy delivery. Um, our alternative, which we, um, based on our analyses, is more cost effective, is to look at ways to further decarbonize the fuel that are, is going through those pipes and make use of those pipes well into the future. Um, so that, that's how we are considering it and talking about it and, and what we're trying to avoid. 
So um, economists will tell you that you shouldn't make decisions based on sunk cost. So if you have an asset and you can't use it anymore to serve the purposes that you want, then you're going to have to figure out how to segue away from it um, or transform it into something that can serve a new purpose. And I think some of the things that Emily talked about, about how we can still use natural gas infrastructure, but to make the gas that that infrastructure moves cleaner because of how you make the gas. There's also a lot going on in the natural gas sector for reducing leakage. As um, Emily mentioned, natural gas is mostly methane. Methane is a greenhouse gas, a powerful greenhouse gas. So when you leak it into the atmosphere, that's bad for the climate, but it's also an energy resource. So by reducing the leakage of methane, from natural gas systems, you can save money, you can save an energy resource, and you can um, be, do something that's good for the environment. Thinking about the carbon capture space, um, there's lots of potential for us to build out the infrastructure that we already have. We have several thousand miles of carbon dioxide pipelines in this country that were built out for moving carbon dioxide from natural or man-made sources to enhanced oil recovery fields. Mm -hmm. So that is an infrastructure that could be built out to move CO2 for other purposes. It could be to do more enhanced oil recovery. It could be to just store the CO2 deep underground. Or it could be used that we move the CO2 around and we make fuels and materials out of it. Pretty much anything that you make that has carbon in it, and that's a lot of stuff, <laughs> you could make from captured carbon dioxide and then you could use the carbon to make materials and fuels. And there's a ton of really interesting things going on. Uh, there's a couple of companies now working on something called direct air capture where you actually capture the CO2 from the atmosphere that's probably more expensive now than, uh, it's definitely more expensive now than capturing it from a source, from an industrial source. But it's coming, the costs are coming down. It's a very exciting area. And a couple of, com of companies are demonstrating capturing CO2 from the atmosphere and then taking that carbon and making it into fuels. So these are fuels that are, they're carbon-based fuels. They're a lot like the fuels we use now, but they're made from captured carbon dioxide. So it's a very exciting space. The, the possibilities are enormous. Um, saying one last thing about enhanced oil recovery, we, ha we have about something on the order of 20 projects worldwide that capture carbon dioxide. Most of them are in North America. And in most cases, the successful projects have used their CO2 for enhanced oil recovery because the oil industry is willing to pay for mm -hmm. CO2. It's not like you, it's, it's not a waste to them, it's a product. So they'll pay you for your CO2, so that forms a revenue stream. So a lot of these projects, or most of these projects, are kind of public-private partnerships where you have the revenue stream from the private sector because they're willing to buy the CO2 for a useful purpose. And then you have, for the newer generation, newer technologies, carbon capture technologies, that the federal government is, is, is giving out grants for or tax credits. So the combination of this public and private action is really moving this industry forward in a way, again, good for the environment, good for the industry, good for creating jobs. Thanks, Judy. Jeff, do you want to jump in? or? Yeah, I, I would just briefly add, we get a lot of questions about stranded assets, and we see this come up in various contexts. And I think broadly, regardless of what part of the value chain you're operating in, I think good governance is crucial to make sure the assets are not stranded. And I think it's also important that as we uh, promote more innovation and open up for more innovation and competition that we don't leave the most vulnerable rate payers on the hook for assets. Thanks, Jeff. So, Judy, one question that came up in my mind, and, and this is a question for, for the full panel. Um, for me, it's, it's very impressive or it's, it's important to think about this opportunity turning carbon dioxide into, an, into a commodity, um, learning how to, you know, match uh, that that CO2 supply as, as perhaps a wasted resource and, and plug it into demand for everything that we have that, that is really built out of carbon. Um, but to do that, we need a pipeline infrastructure. It's not easy to build big infrastructure uh, in this country. Just yesterday, Canada announced that they're going to build their intermountain um, connection and, and pipeline so that they can, because they don't have uh, a keystone option here in the United States to, to move 
um, oil out of uh, out of uh, you know the central part of Canada there. So, what are some of the barriers? And I, I just use that to illustrate. But what are some of the barriers that you are all facing to either maintain the transition and trajectory that you've been on that have helped reduce carbon dioxide emissions, or, or maybe for you, Judy? In terms of thinking about the infrastructure that we're going to need to make this happen, um, what are some of the barriers that that you all are seeing, either from a regulatory standpoint, from a public opinion standpoint? I'm not sure if uh, anyone can can speak to that. So, so I'll start specifically on carbon dioxide pipelines. So, carbon dioxide pipeline infrastructure, for the most part, has been privately developed in this country, just the way it works. It's been um, companies who want to move the CO2 uh, generally for enhanced oil recovery, um, but it could be purposed more broadly. There's a lot of interest in expanding that, so a lot of it would be, you know, you'd have more private investment, but you, may, you need to make sure that states, which generally have jurisdiction over the siting and, and um, permitting these pipelines, that they have the right policies in place. And there are a number of states who are quite advanced in this because they have the infrastructure, and so states can learn from one, one another. And there's a group, um, the, I think it's called the State Carbon Capture Deployment um, Initiative, which is a group of states who are promoting mutual learning about the ones who are, have good policies in place and how they can learn from each other to enable more build out of that infrastructure. There's also potential in the context of federal uh, infrastructure legislation, if it's indeed uh, infrastructure week or not, whatever week it is. Um, we always a good, it's always a good it's subject for conversation. It's always a good time to think about infrastructure. So um, a lot of us would like to see that many of the financing mechanisms that are available for other types of infrastructure could be applied to CO2 pipelines so that you could get the um, access to the, the kinds of financing that infrastructure more broadly gets in this country. And you already have the um, private component a lot of times. So a lot of times this is kind of moving. A lot of the conversation on infrastructure is we it's mostly federally funded. This is more in transportation. Then let's bring the private sector in. Here you've got a lot of private interest mm -hmm. in CO2 pipelines, so you could bring in the public sector and have um, public-private partnerships there. So there's a lot of interest in just, A, making sure that people who work on infrastructure understand that there's such a thing as a carbon dioxide pipeline. A lot of times they're just not part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And then also we think about that as we're thinking about building out clean energy infrastructure because that's what this could be part of. Um, the other issue that comes up is on federal lands, and that's a different issue. And a lot of states can deal with the, the CO2 pipelines on, on uh, regular private lands, but when you get into federal lands, it gets a lot more complicated. So there's a lot of interest for CO2 pipelines and for all kinds of, of um, infrastructure to uh, improve the process for siting and making decisions about how we can put infrastructure on federal lands that enables clean uh, as opposed to other types of um, infrastructure. So there's a lot of room for uh, building on the experience we already have and actually upping our game. Thanks, Judy. Jeff, go ahead. If you can make it work. There we go. I got it. <laughs> Um, I'll be quick. I'd say there's really two buckets of, of how I see barriers. One is legislative. The other is more regulatory. On the legislative side, I think that there often is an issue with fuel-specific policies. And I think we need to uh, distinguish between policies that look for a specific objective, cleaner air, more resilient, more reliable system, uh, and those that are set to promote one technology at the expense of others that we have today or others that we could have in the future, and this, uh, this existed through uh, the proposal last year to uh, support reliability of the grid, but only focusing on power plants that could have 90 days of fuel on site despite you know, any expert or economist telling you that's really irrelevant. The second piece of this, and I think this ties in with the first, you, know, you look at a lot of these legislative battles um, on uh, technology prescriptive or fuel prescriptive policy. And I think what's important to, to look at is the contrast between those who are pushing the policies and those who are tasked with the responsibility of managing the grid and managing reliability. And so when we get into the, the issue of managing the grid, I think that the natural gas power generation industry faces a lot of the same barriers as uh, the new renewable industry in that 
for the most part, with a lot of the RTOs or the regional transmission organizations or in front of public utility commissions, we're kind of the, the new players. And a lot of the rules were written for a grid that really no longer exists. And so helping to improve the stakeholder process and update the mechanics and rules and update the processes by which power plants can compete uh, where these RTOs exist, I think is going to be, it's a barrier today. And I think looking forward as RTOs think about how to integrate more renewables, how to balance the renewables, how to integrate more gas, competitive gas, I think that's going to be a big area for, for, for action. Gotcha. Thanks, Jeff. Emily, do you want to jump in? I'll just add quickly, um, it's kind of been touched on already, but it's important to remember that people still want gas in this country. Our members are still building out yeah. their uh, pipeline infrastructure. We are adding customers year over year. Um, you mentioned the fuel oil issue. Yes, that's still a major problem in the Northeast. And there I'm not alone. <laughs> significant emission savings that yeah. can be had there if we were to switch over and enable those um, customers to get on natural gas. But, you know, New England is also unique in its opposition to infrastructure, um, all sorts of infrastructure. So, you know, whether it's state policies and permitting reform, um, just policies that are anti-gas, um, they're playing favorites with fuel, um, you know, trying to stem the onslaught of these policies. And, and I'll, I'll put it back on us. It's, it's up to us to continue to educate, to mm -hmm. continue to show um, the favorable emissions that natural gas can have, not just now, but well into the future. Um, so we're working every angle we can. But yes, the, the impediment to infrastructure development is a real and significant challenge for us. Can I just gotcha. uh, agree with Jeff on something? I don't know how many things we agree on, but uh, we definitely agree that um, it should be any policy that we're trying to put in place to reduce greenhouse gas emissions should be about the environmental performance. And you know, however you get there, it should be about what yeah. what does the, what gives you the environmental performance you want. And we should be there are many different options, and we should be letting the whole portfolio compete to provide that environmental performance. But it really, in the end, should be what gives us the best environmental performance for a reasonable cost. Yeah, Judy, I, th I think we actually agree on a lot. So I look forward <laughs> to that. <laughs> um, are there any like specific, for because there are people here that are taking notes and looking for ideas on specific policies to work on. Are there any like, you know, six month, 12, 12 month objectives that you all have in terms of specific policies or adjustments that you're looking to make? The last panel, the renewables folks talk about tax credits a lot. Uh, you know, we've heard a little bit about um, more supply side incentives to uh, to to push forward with with uh, clean energy development. Are there specific things? I know that there there are probably a couple in the the blueprint or the the roadmap. So there's a long list in this blueprint. So I <laughs> I promised my colleagues I would show this blueprint at least once, so everyone can vouch that I showed it twice. Um, so you can get that on the carboncapturecoalition.org website. But a few that I'd highlight, um, there's something called, oh, it's in tiny print. This is in your packet. There's a, a set, and this highlights on uh, this slide on page eight, the ones that you know might be of most interest. I'm going to have to take off my glasses to read it. So one is the Use It Act, which supports next generation carbon capture. In particular, it has a, a prize for direct air capture mm -hmm. to sort of advance that technology. It also facilitates the planning, siting, and permitting of pipelines, which I had mentioned. There's something called the Carbon Capture Modernization Act, which is um, an updating of a couple of other tax credits in addition to 45Q that can be helpful to promote investment. Um, and then there's uh, two bills, one on the Senate side and one that's coming on the House side, it's one is the EFFECT Act and one is the Fossil Energy Research and Development Act, and that's to improve overall our investment at the federal level. The Department of Energy does do research on carbon capture, and this is to up our game on that to make sure that we're getting the best technology and really motivating innovation. And, um, and then there's uh, some other financing mechanisms as well as an active effort to make sure that CO2 pipelines are part of the infrastructure conversation. There's probably a lot more, but those are just a few I'd mention. That's more than a few. That's, that's, that's good. Um, Jeff and Emily, do you have any other specific uh, legislation or bills that you're watching? Well, 
I would say even beyond just legislation and bills, for those who are interested, I'd really encourage you to pay close attention to what's happening in the RTOs, the regional transmission organizations. A lot of action on uh, renewables and gas and how different uh, attributes are being looked at by those who manage the reliability of the grid. Yeah, I'll agree with Jeff there. Um, I would say if you're interested in renewable natural gas and what utilities are doing in that space, I would encourage you to look um, into the states, um, specific state programs, California, Oregon, Minnesota, um, New Jersey, uh, Vermont, Maine, and there's several others. But all, um, all of our different members have different programs that they're working on in those states, um, and they're really quite exciting. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Emily. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, thanks, Judy. This has been a, a very informative conversation, and I think I hope you all found it to help round out the dialogue that we've had over over the course of the day. We have covered a lot of territory, but I think that some things that you keep hearing uh, is a, allow for competition, allow for consumers to make the choices, uh, and for Crest as an organization, this is this is what we live and breathe. Is is we're aiming to uh, create opportunities for competitive markets. We're trying to create opportunities for individuals to get what they want when it comes to the power sector or the energy sector, uh, which are creative solutions that, that are leading to, to cleaner and cleaner outcomes that matter, uh, not just for this generation, but, but for generations to come. So it's been uh, a great morning. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. Thanks to these panelists. Um, and we get kicked out of this room in 15 minutes. So if you have any questions, uh, please, please come on up and, and ask. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.